it's a strange thing to think about. I think, you know, for, for me, it really sort of just started with the question of, do we need animals to have meat? Hello, hello. Hey, how are you? I'm super excited. Do I pronounce your first name Arya? It's Arya. Aria. Oh, guys. Yeah, exactly. See, my, my production team, when they spelled it phonetically, I was like, I don't think so. I don't <laughs> think that's how we're going to say it. So, yeah, it's a bit of an unusual one, but uh, yeah. Are you having a good day? Having a good day. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a nice day in San Francisco. Um, it's uh, having moved here from, from the East Coast, it's, uh, it's, it's still amazing to me that in January, um, you can just kind of walk outside and not be, you know, just completely, um, you know, affected by by the cold in, in the same way. So yeah, it's nice here. Yeah, it's cold down here in Florida too. Usually it's hot all year. This is one of the first cold seasons we have. But I just connected a couple dots. Okay, so say again how you pronounce your name. Aria. Okay, Ar so my daughter's name is Aria, and I have a bunch of friends who are like Hasidic Jews, and they were like, "Oh, you chose a strong male name for your daughter," and I was like. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I took it from like the musical element of Aria. Right. To, to the Italian music. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so they, they all, they all uh, were like, Oh, how's your son? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. It's um, it, it's, there's also a third one, which is more of the, the kind of like Aria. That's the, you know, the Aryan race. And I often, you know, um, many people from India will name their, their children Arya as well. So there's the Italian one and mine means lion, which, uh, yeah, is usually used for, um, uh, used for a guy, although Ariel or Ariella, it's the same thing. And, um, and it's the same meaning just mean, means lion. Nice. Strong strength lion. I like <laughs> right. it. Is that how you feel inside? Is that like your inner, Some days. inner energy? Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> I think when, <laughs> I think when you, uh, um, yeah, na names are important, you know, when you go through life, you know, feeling like you're, you're named after a lion. I, I know people who are named Zev, which means wolf, um, or Dove, which means bear. Um, I think you, you definitely adopt some of these, uh, yeah, there, there, there's something that you, you identify with, uh, for sure. Um, when, 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 when that's your name. And so to try to like connect it back, do lions eat salmon? I want to know. <laughs> I, so I, well, this is not like, uh, a podcast on like the lineages of like names and things of that nature. I heard my production team, they were saying, guys, you got to check this out. They're using technology and they're making artificial salmon. And um, maybe we don't like that word. I don't know. But I know nothing about this industry. I got to learn there's like this whole cellular, like cellular art agriculture industry, yeah. if I'm saying that correctly. Mm -hmm. And when I saw your website and what you were doing, I thought the brand was beautiful. I thought it was really cool. And I wanted to just talk with you and, and be like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of, um, it's a strange thing to think about. I think, you know, for, for me, it really sort of just started with the question of, do we need animals to have meat, um, which is a weird one because we always think about, you know, meat having, you know, comes from, from animals. Um, but I think there's, there's a time in, in every child's, uh, life that, you know, they sort of make the connection that, um, you know, when they're eating chicken, for example, that, 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 that was a chicken or <laughs> when they're eating fish, that that was a fish. And, and, you know, it's something that we all kind of, you know, go through and it's, um, we, we sort of learn to to accept that that we rely on animals as a source of meat. Um, and I, uh, I actually grew up in, in Australia and, and was was traveling there um, during residency um, after uh, I'd finished that medical school and and was was thinking about this and all of the advancements that had been made in stem cell technology and uh, how how we could use these to, you know, potentially just grow the same thing that we would need for, you know, to, to consume the same meat and seafood just outside of the animal. And, um, and that's where all of this, you know, kind of um, began for me. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a, a fascinating question. So yes, um, at, at wild type that, that is what we do. We, um, grow seafood and salmon in particular, uh, from, from their cells and, but just grow the parts that we would consume, um, you know, typically in either farmed fish or fish that are caught wild, um, 
about half of the, the fish is typically discarded. You know, these are parts that we don't typically eat, right? Um, the, you know, the tails, the fins, the heads, the, the, a lot of the, the internal organs. And, and so why not just, you know, create what, what we need to? That sounds pretty cool. You know, in 2000, I think like 2011 or 12, uh, so my brother and uh, like stepmom are both physicians. Oh, okay. And so I always get to like pull stuff out of technology world because I know nothing about like the medical stuff. I pull pull stuff over and then ask them questions and we have good good dinner conversations. And I had seen this YouTube video of them like printing uh, like a liver or a heart and they like they had retrofitted this printing machine to print cells and layer them and yeah, basic concept, right? And so I was like, the first thing is, I, my first instinct was frustration. If I'm watching like a scientist in a home lab print an organ, <laughs> why is it that we have shortages on these lists and it's going to take 10 years for these things to get approved? Like, let's put a fast track stamp on that, right? Um, and and then the second thing was like, that's unbelievable how these, these cells can grow. Because I mean, we're just collections of these cells that are replicating. And so- I thought it was absolutely fascinating that you could just like grow the part of the salmon that we eat. Like, what is it? What does it look like? Like, do you, are you doing this right? By the way, is this like already done? Like, can, have you eaten the grant, the salmon? Yeah, of course. Uh, we have, you know, I, I, on our website, th those, those pictures are of what we are, what we have created. And so we, we work to create the, the kind of the muscle cells and, and, you know, the fat cells and the connective tissue and all, all the kinds of things that don't, don't sound so appetizing on their own, but they are the, the, the you know, such an important part of, of what um, the, the whole experience of, uh, of seafood and, and salmon in particular. But but you're right. You know these these kinds of technologies um, were really only became a thing um, within the last you know decade to, to 15 years. Um, I'd say that you know if, if there was one thing that uh, one discovery that that kind of um, propelled it further than than anything else. Um, it was one that came in, in around 2006 uh, in a lab in, in Japan, in Kyoto, um, in the, the lab of Professor Shinya Yamanaka. And he, his lab discovered that we could create stem cells from ordinary skin cells. Uh, before then, um, embryos were the only sources of, of stem cells. And by stem cell, I mean, these are, these are cells that have two remarkable features. They, they're able to, to double faster than any um, cell in the body and they can become any, any cell in the body. They can become a, a neuron, a liver cell, you know, anything. Um, and so for exactly the reason you're, you're describing in terms of, you know, like organ transplantation and so forth, this, this became um, now it opened a, a whole new like world of, of potential for um, rather than, than waiting for, for donors. Um, if, for example, I would need a, a new liver at some point, the idea is from one of my skin cells, we grow a new liver, put it back in me, and it's, you know, it's my cells. And um, I, we wouldn't sort of, you know, need to go on medications to suppress the immune system and all of these things. So, yeah, I thought about this a lot in, in residency. I, I actually did, did grad school, did my PhD. Um, mostly in Japan in the same university, in the same institute that um, Professor Yamanaka's group was around the same time. And it was a very, very inspiring uh, moment for me. And then came back um, to uh, to the US and um, finished uh, uh, med school. And it was in residency that I was sort of thinking about these um, the, these uh, technologies and and what we could do with them beyond the biomedical sciences for, for food. And with your time in Japan, it seems fitting that like the picture on your homepage is sushi, right? And that, that's <laughs> right, like a lot right. of your example. Cause it's like over there, it's an art. It's a very real thing to, you spend like years as like an underling. And yeah. I, I saw a very brief like documentary type thing on it. And I was like, I was like, whoa, it's like a sacred thing to be uh, a chef over there. And um, so For sure. sushi is, do, do you know the one thing that's like would hold me up? on this sushi thing or like the, the, the meat in general. What is it? I just want to be like, okay. So yeah, I want to hear it. I, I'm all for it. hundred percent. Mm -hmm. I've got a daughter. Uh, we talked earlier, Aria. Yeah. Um, and when we drive her to, to school, to daycare, we drive by cows and horses and, and like trying to explain to her, like, that's a hamburger. Um, you, you can kind of feel the tension there, right? Like, right. I like meat. That's cool. Uh, but it, it feels hard to explain it to this sweet little girl. Right. And so uh, I'm for it, but everything I've tried is like, 
so not close to it. And I, I know that it's got to progress, but like how, how on point is your salmon? <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's, that's a great question. And particularly, you know, for starting a food company, I think it's, it's very different from, let's say something like software where you can have betas and you can sort of, people will um, really judge the, the, the product based on how it tastes. And it's, it's a very, it's a very visceral feeling that people have, you, you know, um, I will say that some of the challenges that let's say the plant-based industry has faced is you're sort of taking plant proteins, breaking them down and then sort of recreating something that approximates um, meat and, and seafood. And, and that's a very difficult thing. I'd say particularly in the case of something like, like salmon that has very subtle flavors. Um, uh, particularly wild caught, you know, just fresh out of the rivers or, or the or the ocean. Um, Salmon will have this 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 very um, kind of um, I, I'd say it's it, it's, an, it's an elusive kind of flavor, but it is a very subtle one. Um, and so, to the advantage we have in creating meat in this way is that we are actually working with the same cells um, that uh, are growing, you know, within salmon to create that salmon meat. And um, more than just the the taste, you know, these cells are. Um, are programmed to become things like muscle and fat, and and it starts with this sort of you know ultra structure, this the structure of of the the um, the cells, how they um, align with each other, how they organize and mature, and and from from that kind of microscopic level, um, the the wonders of of salmon as meat, uh, you know, sort of uh, develop, and so so you know we are still, you know, working on, you know, figuring out exactly which nutrients the cells love the most to become our favorite cuts of, you know, uh, of, of, of salmon, how do, um, you know, cells decide to become to take up more fats, for example, or become more lean. Um, and so these are things that that we've had to do as part of our R&D um, in house. And uh, I will say, though, um, it tastes like salmon. It's you know it's something that that needs to get better, um, uh, and and we are making better every day. Uh, but that's uh, that's something that we we've you know I, I can tell you, and I and I hope someday very soon you you'll you know be able to try it as well. Yeah, that's what I was asking. I, I said, hey, did they ship us some salmon? And then <laughs> we're like, it's early, so I was like, what is it like a million dollars a pound? <laughs> like. Yeah, you know, we, when we started, if we were to have made, um, let's say, a, a pound of salmon in the way that we um, were, were doing it, which was a very inefficient system, um, just because we were using the most sort of like pure, refined, pharma-grade <laughs> ingredients and nutrients for these cells, it probably would have cost something like $400,000 a pound. Um, so that's <laughs> it's changed a lot since then, since 2016, um, and uh, but but certainly you know one of the the most important aspects of of all of this is um, reaching a, a price point that is um, not just equivalent to um, to salmon, but um, but even at some point below that. Um, you can imagine there's there's so many inefficiencies of, of our uh, current uh, system of, of um, producing uh, fish and, and seafood. Um, not, not only do we have to either pull the fish out of the water or sort of like farm them, um, usually that sort of starts on land, then goes out to uh, the, the areas along the coast, and then they have to be harvested and processed and distributed and all these kinds of things. And in the U.S., um, a large percentage of, of the fish that are caught are actually sent offshore, often to places like Asia for processing and then come back to the US. And it's just, you know, in, insane to think about all of these kinds of, you know, um, issues of traceability and just the inefficiency of all of that. Um, and so for, for us, you know, we believe eventually we'll have the uh, the nutrients um, you know in 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 a sort of like you know food grade formulations that we feed the cells the same things that they would be eating uh, in the wild um, without some of the you know toxins and contaminants that that we kind of um, accept as a part of uh, seafood today and um, and get bring bring down the costs in in those ways. How well, where's the cost at today? It's still, you know, it's something that the changes uh, from from week to week. Um, I'd say, you know, we're still we're like, 
around two orders of magnitude less than than when we had begun. Um, still haven't achieved um, the, the the cost of conventional fish um, today, um, but are, are definitely working towards that. That is awesome. I, first of all, I'm very excited just <laughs> seeing it. You know, if you had just said it cut, cut in half in three or four years, like that would have been awesome. But mm -hmm. it cut even more in half. Um, that is that is very very exciting. Like I I do you feel like a very rich man when you're trying it when you're eating it? <laughs> <laughs> I you know just knowing all of the sort of work that that goes into it. Um, and uh, I I'd say that you know that the, the team. That, um, that that we have at, at Wild Type is it's just such a such a passionate, such you know, sort of like hardworking and just you know, wonderful, wonderful people. That it it's sort of you know, for me, it's 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 always an, an appreciation of of that more than uh, more than anything else, more than the actual you know cost of of <laughs> what it takes to to produce it. Nice, you're good with words. Uh, <laughs> uh, I like you already. Okay, so. I'm curious because I'm an entrepreneur. I own a business. Mm -hmm. um, you do as well. When we talk about cost of salmon, are you um, taking like the entire cost, like operationally of your existence and dividing that by how much it's produced? Or are you talking about the cost of the goods to actually create it? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. You know, when, when we do our cost estimates, um, typically we'll leave the, um, you know, CapEx is, is, is one thing. Um, and we'll look at all of the cost drivers to actually produce, uh, to produce it once those, you know, CapEx uh, expenses are, are accounted for. In other words, just assuming that we have the equipment and, and, and so forth. So for that, it's things like, what are the inputs? Um, what are the um, you know utilities that go into sort of keeping these things going? Um, I'd say that the the inputs and in particular labor, which maybe um, you know startups at at early stages like ours don't often um, don't often account for, um, but that labor is is the one that um, you know ultimately as we sort of increase the scale of production, um, the those efficiencies of scale will will help to to reduce those costs. So so it really is 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 labor um, the the various inputs and and by inputs I mean things like the nutrition that that we um, feed the cells with. These are you know just things like. Um, Proteins, fats, sugars, the, the same kinds of things that, um, you know, a, a fish or any organism uh, requires. Um, and then, you know, the way that we grow them is similar to a um, kind of like a brewery type system. And so if you can imagine, you know, these sort of uh, very, very similar to what we, you know, what we know of in the, the fermentation industry. Um, and uh, that that's that's often a, a model we, we use to sort of, you know, think about what scaling looks like, um, and uh, and 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 so the, the, that's really sort of how we calculate the costs. Is is it at a point today where you could take like you could take a seasoned cut of this fish, cooked seasoned, mm -hmm. uh, and swap it out on someone's plate at a restaurant, and they wouldn't know the difference? I don't think so, because when we say seasoned cut, that often means something, you know, like a like a salmon steak, and that level of complexity is one that um, I believe we will achieve, but have not yet achieved. Um, and uh, you know, I think that if you were to look at a spectrum from, you know, at, at the sort of one end, it's kind of like minced salmon that you would, you know, have like in a spicy salmon roll, for example. And on the other end of the spectrum um, is like your finest uh, salmon steak that is, you know, just <laughs> absolutely perfect in every way. Um, I'd say that that most uh, startups in, in our space and us uh, included have not yet achieved that, you know, kind of like amazing um, super complex um, uh, salmon steak. And so I, you know, bet when it comes to maybe less complex um, cuts, uh, like what you'd see on a, um, uh, in, in different, you know, maki or nigiri um, uh, type of um, uh, preparations or even smoked salmon on a bagel, um, we've, we've done this and, uh, and, you know, just kind of with, with, with us and, um, and, and it, it really tastes very, very similar. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's more similar than not. Um, I think that there's still some things that if you sort of like, you know, look very closely, 
um, the cells have just grown in a different environment. And so they, they grow, uh, you know, a little bit differently. Um, those are things that we're working to sort of, you know, make closer and closer to what you you have in the wild and just sort of encouraging the cells to, to do the same thing that they would within within a salmon. Um, but um, but we've gotten pretty far in terms of, you know, that kind of comparison and and um, and, you know, importantly, I think that the nutrition is, is, uh, is, is a really, you know, critical component of all of this. One of the reasons why, um, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a cardiologist and, you know, still, still work in the, the intensive care unit and, and think about the, the health benefits of, of these kinds of things and, and wanted to, to create a product that um, is, you know, a rich source of protein of omega-3 fatty acids um, and you know just generally for, for for whatever that it this term means it's is sort of good for you is <laughs> is at least you know nutritious um, and of course free of the things that we were talking about like mercury microplastics and all of these other you know things that that exist in, in seafood today um, and so it's it's you know not only do we think that reaching equivalence in terms of the sensory aspect is important but also the nutrition nutritional equivalence is, is something that, um, that we strive for. Yeah. I love the fact that you remove the pollutant concept <laughs> right. from it, right? You don't remove pollutants from it. I, I meant from like the, the life cycle of yeah. we usually fear where we're fishing, uh, based off of potential contaminants. But what you do is you get these like best of breed salmon cells, and then you produce, you like amplify those. Exactly. Yeah, that's that, that's exactly what it is. And you know, things like mercury should never be found in our fish. <laughs> Thing, <laughs> things like arsenic, and you know, like that. There is there is no reason why why that should should be there. And so to be able to create um, a product with all of the same nutritional benefits and without all of those, um, you know, I'd say more you know, deleterious kind of, uh, you know, consequences of, of these uh, contaminants um, is I think one of the, the greatest things that, that our industry can, can, uh, can offer. Are you going to take like a Tesla? Like I'm kind of seeing you as the Elon Musk of salmon. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. But, yeah. And we'll say that the, uh, the salmon steak is your Mars, right? You're going to get the whole team to go there. Yeah. But, but do you, when will it be out? Like, do you have a price point? Like, are you going to take that, that concept that Musk did where he puts out like a luxury car first that helps pave the way so the more affluent people will be able to purchase it. That will then drive the adoption of it. And finally, the ultimate goal is low cost salmon for everybody. That's extremely healthy. Like his with the cars. It, are you yeah. going to release it soon or? So there, there are a lot of similarities, um, in terms of that, that model. Um, ultimately our goal is to have a meaningful, you know, environmental impact and one on, you know, food security. There's just the, the population of this earth, um, you know, is just growing, um, and uh, the the demand for meat and seafood is is just increasing so much that our current ways of producing uh, meat and seafood, and in particular for for seafood, um, you know, we've overfished um, most of uh, the you know our conventional um, fish stocks. Um, fish farming on its own has been shown to be not uh, really a um, sustainable practice in, in many cases, although there have been many improvements that, that have been made since the early days. And so what we see is, you know, is another source of, of this, this kind of um, food that, that we love. And by the way, I think there should always be a market for sustainably fished, um, you know, salmon. Um, if, if, you know, people are true stewards of our oceans and, and care about uh, the numbers of fish that they pull out of the water, and this is a, you know, a, a great uh, nutritious product, uh, I think those people should be able to charge a real premium for for those kinds of fish, and and it should be you know it should cost much more. But for us, yes, we we want to have that sort of inex um, relatively inexpensive but very high quality um, product that's that's available to everybody. And so to get there, um, you know, obviously, you know, we're, the there's a there's an initial release, and and I'll sort of like you know talk about that in a second to your question. Um, but the the path you know is one where 
uh, at least in the beginning, the amount that we're able to produce is going to be um, somewhat limited. And so for, for that reason, we, we want to begin with, um, with restaurants. And, um, and when you think of like restaurants versus you know, retail, like supermarkets, and so restaurants is, are the place that, that we'd want to begin. Um, for one reason, we're, we're kind of co-building this with a lot of the chefs and restaurateurs that, that we've worked with. We've um, you know, been able to um, pull together a really interesting community of um, these, you know, food creatives, and and love hearing the insights of, you know, how does this taste, and what for like preparation would this work really well? What is not great about it? Um, this is some of our, you know, greatest lessons we've learned uh, just by, you know, handing the <laughs> a sample to a chef. Um, it's been some of the most humbling moments as well um, <laughs> when when our product, you know, in, in the early days in particular, didn't perform very well. Um, but uh, that that's also part of, you know, kind of explaining the, the, the story of how this is created, um, of, of what this is, because it's such a such a different source of, um, of of foods that I think people sometimes, you know, it's not a is this a veggie? like imitation is this like what you know like what what exactly is it and and i think that um you know just sort of releasing it in, in supermarkets for for that reason probably isn't the uh, the, the best um but there's one aspect that i wanted to, to talk about about the the timing which is for such a new product like this um i think that what's what's super important um especially in a place like uh, the us is um, people's perceptions around safety. And so um, the regulatory component, um, what do you call this even? Um, how is it regulated? What kinds of safety studies, you know, um, do we do to uh, to ensure the the safety? Um, these are the kinds of conversations we're now having with uh, with regulators, and um, and in particular for us, it's it's the FDA. For other types of meats, um, it's it's actually USDA and uh, FDA, um, and that's been a fascinating process to to think about. Um, food safety in in the same way that that these regulators do, and it's been a really um, just actually a, a very um, enriching <laughs> conversation that um, that we've had um, thinking through these things. But the bottom line is we don't know um, you know when, how, even if this uh, this type of product will be approved for sale in the United States, and so so that's something that we um, never said a you know, like publicly talk about a date because I think we need to be um, just cognizant of the fact that it's not entirely in our control. Oh, yeah. So give me an example. Let's talk about not your company. But let's talk about the industry. Mm -hmm. Like when do you foresee some of the first uh, commercially of it? Like when, when do you foresee it that I could go into a restaurant and maybe not all the restaurants, but like yeah. some of the nicer restaurants or some of the uh, sushi restaurants, they would have some of this material or, or some of this salmon like normally. Mm -hmm. Like, is that in like five years? Like, yeah, I think it's less than five years. And actually, um, uh, Eat Just, which is another um, you know company in our space here, here in San Francisco, actually received regulatory approval in Singapore and um, made the first sale of this this type of product. They made chicken nuggets, um, and from what I understand, it's actually you know, just on, on the menu now at this one restaurant in, in Singapore. And so I think we're closer than, than five years, you know, assuming that um, regulatory issues are, are not a hurdle here. Um, I think we'll start to see this in, you know, a handful of restaurants within the next couple of years. You know, it's amazing what we were able to do with COVID when with regulatory, uh, I can't even say it, re regulations. We were able to just kind of like, whoop, you know, and get stuff going. And I was talking um, even during the pandemic, I was talking to David Blair. So he is the CTO of this company called Andela, and mm -hmm. they do oh, yeah, like yeah. In, they do like engineering teams. They're backed by like Zuckerberg and all, that foundation and everything. But they specialized because they went into Africa, which was an emerging market. They got all these people together, trained them on developers, engineers, opened up these like schools. It was a really cool thing how they were helping the world and. And they're a fantastic company. I got the way I found out about them is I got a bunch of recommendations of people telling me that they use them and to go check them out. And then I was like, oh, let's have them on the show. Um, but they're changing the world out there, right? You guys are changing the world out there. And I was just curious um, 
because we were talking about population growth on on that episode with Africa emerging and basically millions of people getting electricity and coming online, we kind of take that for granted. Like in our everyday life, we just imagine that everybody kind of has a cell phone and the internet, but large swaths of our, I think it was like 50% of the world doesn't have internet. It's pretty crazy. But these people coming online, growing their populations and the earth growing, like do you run these types of calculations as far as like how many people there are versus how many fish we need? And maybe there comes a day when it is so in demand that we need to feed the people that the regulations get sped up. Is that like something that's on your mind at all? Yeah. I mean, you know, there are reports every year put out by um, the World Health Organization, by, you know, um, the food agriculture, the FAO. These are about the state of our fisheries and, um, where you know, um, in in particular, there are um, there are many communities that depend on fishing and um, are really struggling, not just from a you know nutritional um, perspective, um, but certainly also from an economic perspective. And um, the, the these numbers are are out there um, and are constantly sort of being updated and. They are increasingly, you know, not not to be a, a total downer, but they're increasingly becoming more and more dire. And and so, you know, we really, you know, when I after moving to to San Francisco, and um, I I had met my co-founder Justin um, almost ten years ago. He he was actually at the the business school when I was um, a, a resident, and and he sort of really sees things in. In, in this way of um, you know food insecurity, the actual eventual you know costs of of meat and seafood over time um, versus the, the the populations and um, and this is something that from from this sort of like scientific more technical perspective of of, of mine and and his we we've really influenced the way that that each of us sort of sees the world and and this is something that I think about all of the time now um, it's hard to imagine. Uh, you know, the, um, when we're such a small company right now, of only 20 of us, uh, you know, that thinking about uh, massive impact, but I do think that this is the future um, in terms of uh, having a healthy, sustainable, um, just, you know, and relatively accessible, um, high quality protein sources for, for the world. Yeah, the future's happening even faster now. Like before you could see a technology, you'd watch it. There was one report, you would watch it mature over 10 years. It would kind of start to come into something, then it would come out and then it would take another decade to even spread across. Now things are coming out, refining, improve. Like I was just yeah. talking the other day about like uh, they're storing uh, data inside of DNA. Right, which yeah. Is it's fascinating. It, it is fascinating. You know, Another great example of that is is obviously the the vaccine, um, the two vaccines that are, that are currently approved in in the U.S. And you know that that particular technology of um, of R messenger RNA uh, as a therapeutic is is what I worked on um, before starting Wild Type, and it's what brought me to to San Francisco. I was working at UCSF on cardiac therapeutics that were RNA based. And um, I, you know, as, as I mentioned, I'm, you know, still still work in the the ICU, and so I was um, felt very lucky to have um, to have received the vaccine. Um, and it was a very it was a very emotional moment for me. It was this, you know, I couldn't believe that that this thing that I that that I had worked on, and um, you know, was not a single therapeutic anywhere. No trials had been <laughs> run just a few years ago. Now. With two, you know, uh, you know, companies had run simultaneous uh, safety and efficacy studies, and was you know our our best chance at at <laughs> defeating this this pandemic. Um, it's incredible how quickly some of these things happen when when people are, are really focused on on just you know achieving that. Um, yeah, it's you, you're right that <laughs> the future happens. I feel like the future comes to us faster now. <laughs> Yeah, and I think vaccines are a good topic of conversation to talk about like fear too, mm -hmm. because I was going to ask about fear in relation to you uh, presenting salmon, like whether it's to people or the corporations that fish and all of that. But with um, the mRNA stuff, what was interesting to me was, you know, there's the world kind of splits, right? And we're working on unification right now, but when the world kind of splits, it's like, okay, well, there's a lot of, you know, upset people right and even intra family 
things right mm-hmm. and so i i'm a nerd so i was like let's go research this like i go pubmed and check it out right yeah yeah <laughs> and so i started getting as geeky as i could um and when i found out how the mrna concept work where it, normal vaccines actually have a version of the the virus in it but this is the signature of it so it doesn't actually they don't even have to manufacture the virus right. to to produce this just those small concepts that I could understand. I was like, this is a brilliant breakthrough. And then, so I was, uh, hanging out with my brother who's like really, really great doctor too. I, unfortunately, <laughs> like I found him on health grades and I was like, you're one of the best rated doctors <laughs> in our city. I was like, that sucks. I was hoping to make fun of you but because <laughs> we're brothers, right? But, right. Right. Of course. Yeah. Of give course. Gotta time. give him a heart. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and so I was, so I have a lot of respect for him. I actually went and bought his name as a domain. <laughs> I love it. It'll like, <laughs> be great. worth more money in 10 years. <laughs> so, so, uh, I asked him, I was like, yeah, I was like, I think the technology is really cool, but everything I read made me think that this was the first time they've used MRNA technology. And he was, and so he corrected me. He said, no, no, no. They used to use it in AB and, or they have used it previously in these other things over here. It's just not like widespread use. And I, and so for me, that was actually pretty interesting information because I'm always hesitant as an early adopter when it comes to things like uh, health, like I'll early adopt technology all day. But to find the way the articles I was reading made me feel like the mRNA was a brand new technology that was just now created just for this. And it is not. It is something that's existed and is already currently, you call it therapeutics, like already in therapeutics and things Mm -hmm. like that. And so that made me feel a lot better about it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I guess I... I wish that there was just more of that kind of dialogue. I don't, I don't know how to foster that sometimes when, um, because I think that a skepticism or a, you know, an initial just, you know, suspicion or just wanting more information is great. It's healthy. It's what science is based on, you know, it's, it's, it's just not taking what somebody else says, uh, for, you know, as, as, as the truth and, and just looking for other, you know, arguments to support or, or, or not support that. And, um, it's, that's one of the things that's just been, um, I think over time, as we see in this particular case, more people get vaccinated that the sort of same number, number of adverse events are just on par with what, you know, all of our vaccines, um, currently are and that people you know will develop a sense of trust and i think it's you know that's um that's natural um but i but i do wish that there was you know just more of this kind of like is this really a new technology like how has this been studied what truly are the concerns when we think about using a vaccine like this in in the first um uh for for the first time it's probably different from the, the scientists probably have different or the physicians have different um, ideas of what might be, you know, um, problematic about it than, um, than, than others might. And so I, I think that just, yeah, more of this kind of conversation is, is, is what we need. And we need more nutrients because I was watching this origin series <laughs> and they were explaining to us how some of the nutrients actually improved our brain and our cognitive abilities. And you mentioned that several times. So there's yeah. truth to that. Nutrients in general, I, I I think just like anything else, it's um, it's probably more in the details and how much you know, like which ones and what what doses and and, and so forth. Um, but but certainly, I think that um, when it comes to like the evolution of our brains and um, you know certain certain nutrients have been critically important in um, being able to create these you know kinds of complex uh, networks and and so forth that um that have given us the the intelligence that that we have still more intelligence that we need but <laughs> oh yeah but i was driving yesterday and i was actually thinking about that there's like a spectrum of intelligence and we kind of are always default because there's so much input our brains are trained to focus down on our small communities our families and things right. like that but you know sometimes I'll do like volunteering stuff or get to experience the spectrum that is humanity. And it's just, it's amazing. And so when I then go watch a documentary on how nutrients impacted our evolution, 
and our abilities to think critically or control emotions. And then I can go out into public and I can see a spectrum of people of all shapes and sizes from, you know, like homeless type people to, yeah. you know, well-off people. I see, I can just see the variety and it's so interesting because, uh, I just, I don't know, whoever created this game, whatever is going on here with life, I think it's absolutely fascinating. I don't mean to get too far, too far. No, off, I, but. I, I, I'm actually glad you said that. You know, it's, it's one of the, I think it's exactly what you just said is, is probably the reason that, um, that I've stayed with, um, with medicine throughout this. And even if, you know, I'm not working at, in the hospital nearly as much as, you know, I, I was during residency, um, as you can imagine, wild type is, you know, feels like three full-time jobs, but, um, but it's, it feels like a, a really special place to be in, you know, in the hospital and particularly, um, you know, with just to be part of patients' lives in this way um, and to, to, to feel part of that humanity that you're describing and to, um, it's, it's a, it's a really amazing thing. It's, it's, it's why I went into medicine to, you know, in, in the first place. It's amazing how adaptable we are across social structures and all types of boundaries. Like I can connect with pretty much anyone who can have a conscious conversation. Yeah. Right? Isn't that amazing <laughs> that, you know, yeah. and, 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 and what's, what's always amazing to us more than that is you know, we imagine that there's something about growing up in, let's say, the U.S. or like the, but these are things that, if you're put in an, another country in a completely different cultural context in a totally different part of the world, these things really are universal, and we can, you know, create these, these very, you know, deep bonds of just, you know, understanding and um, uh, with with pretty much anyone. It's it's fascinating to me as well. I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, when I started, when I got the first opportunities to travel internationally, like you have this, like before you get to do that, you have this whole like mental image of what it might be or what you've heard and everything. And then you go there and you're like, this is just like over there. <laughs> right, right. There's, there's more in common than there are different things. I mean, over there, we've got people in our city that speak multiple languages. Over yeah. here, there's people that speak like, okay, the food is like, different but there's like some really great stuff and there's some stuff i already know it's just amazing how um you know i really think that this act of of we're, we're in this sort of like technological puberty right now mm -hmm. where we basically all just turned on at the same time and are learning on how to be mature with that <laughs> but um, but I, i'm it's a great analogy I, I like right that. yeah <laughs> that's what i feel like we're yeah. in it it's true. I, I I wonder what a more sort of mature version of of us incorporating technology in our lives will look like in in the future. Hopefully, a, a more mature and and not you know an even more rebellious teenager <laughs> doing more destructive things. I think growing. I, I I don't like the way it sounds. I don't like the 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 sentence "growing neat in labs." Like we have to find a better <laughs> way to say that, yeah. right? but nobody uh, likes that <laughs> nobody likes that nobody likes it but uh how about like not slaughtering animals like i'm cool with that like you know nobody likes the sound if you if you talk i've been experimenting with this since i knew you were coming on the show mm -hmm. um like i'll be around friends or in some some setting or something and i'll say um something along the lines of uh oh yeah it doesn't sound uh or you don't like the sound of me saying i shot a cow in the head with a bolt gun and 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 cooked it and ate it but you eat hamburgers like we don't it, it, we kind of find this way to like bifurcate what yeah. the action is and what we're doing so that where it's like diffused responsibility and and right. I, but i also struggle with my internal stuff like i feel like i'd have no problem hunting like it would not be a great moment it would not be an exciting moment to have to kill but like to kill and prepare the animal i was like you would honor the animal and you would do that so like i'm okay with that but at the same time, it's like, if we don't have to do that, like if you can produce something right. that's in, indistinguishable in a more economical way or in an equally economical way, it, or even if an unequally economical way, like if you could just produce, it's the texture, man. That's what it is. Yeah. Aria, it's the texture. If you You're can so give me right. the texture and the taste, everyone, so everyone would be on board. I don't, there's like, there's nobody that's going to be like, Oh no, I love the fact that when I hunt wild animals, I have to get my own meat tested that I cook because I don't <laughs> know if those specific deer have this issue. Like 
the hunters would even like it, you know? Yeah, it's true. I mean, you know, when they've at, when social scientists have asked people, like, what is it that you like about meat? For the overwhelming majority of people, it's not the fact that it comes from a dead animal. Like people don't, <laughs> like that's not what people like about meat. They like how it tastes. They like the sort of, you know, cultural aspects of it. They like what it, what it represents. What, there, there are all kinds of things, the, the nutrition of all, all of these things. And so you're right, we, we're very good at um, kind of isolating ourselves from the whole process of, um, you know, what, what it takes to, to, to harvest meat. Um, I think in your, in your case of, you know, hunting for your own, it, I think hunters probably appreciate the meat they have much more because of, you know, just every, everything that goes into hunting an animal. And um, I, I totally agree. But I'm curious, actually, because you said nobody likes the sound of lab-grown meat. And from the beginning of this industry, we actually haven't really been able to come up with a great way to a great name for it, a great kind of like, um, you know, cellular agriculture, that sounds really abstract. It sounds nice, but like, what does that really mean? And, and anything that says cells, I, I, I don't know how appetizing that is, right? Um, and then people have looked at, well, we have plant-based, um, which was basically a word that was created because um, of the negative connotations with veganism. And so anything that was sort of vegan, people wanted like another way to say like, this is, you know, <laughs> and, and so, so now we have plant-based, which, you know, um, it sounds great. And so the, the way of distinguishing um, our uh, industry of actually growing sort of real meat in this way was to call it cell-based. Um, but there are a lot of problems with that because everything is made of cells. Plants are made of cells. So anything that's plant-based is, is also <laughs> sort of cell-based. And so I, I'm curious, what, what do you think a good <laughs> word would be for this? By the way, this is like my favorite thing in the world right now, coming really? up with names and stuff. Oh, yeah. I've, we need I, your help. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to work on it. I don't think I give it to you on the spot, but I've got to drop. I'm going to see right after this, right? Um, I'm going home, grabbing the cooler, picking up the kids from school, and we're going to drive across the state to see a rocket launch. Oh, wow. So we're going to camp out there tonight, and it's going to launch in the morning. So oh, amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. So on the drive, I'm going to put this to work in the back of my mind because you're. This is. I thought you would... This is a problem that needs to be solved. Yeah. It's, uh, we just need to come up with the phrase that people are okay with and they're willing to give it a shot. Right. I imagine it might be in the future something that is some some new term, you know, something that that people haven't used previously. That now, like people start to understand what this is. You know, th this was a big problem with the dairy industry really objected to the use of you know almond milk because almonds don't produce <laughs> milk, right? I, I, don't, I don't know if you're familiar with this. Oh, like the, I am. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, the, the, the legal cases behind it, the, this is just fascinating to me. Um, but the, the sort of extent to which this became an issue um, is, is, is the more fascinating. <laughs> um, and so I think that this will be something very, very similar. You know, if this is nutritionally the same structurally like under a microscope looks the same has the same dna as you know as as fish uh, from the in every single way like is actually the same but it's just created in a different way um how how can it not be called salmon right um but i think you know people just have this this idea that it needs to in order for it to be salmon it needs to come from a salmon um so well, it does you're just amplifying the salmon cell you're amplifying existing cells right you're right. not manufacturing the base cells you're amplifying existing right, ones right or cloning we, them to some degree exactly we we start with with cells from from a salmon so um that's but that's that's still a you know an open debate and and um you can imagine that there are groups of people who who want to portray this as not real meat or not real salmon or not real seafood um and and yet i think you know ultimately what we want is just transparency for customers to to know what it is what how it was made what 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 it has what it doesn't have you know things like that and um but it's it's tough you need to have like a whole hour long conversation like this <laughs> to to sometimes explore that and when it's on a restaurant menu you know that opportunity often doesn't exist yeah there's there's definitely a couple ways to do it that are running through my head. Um, but yeah, I, I, I ran a, in our, in our prep meeting, 
they extensively explained to me the battle that is the milk and there's billboards there's billboards that <laughs> right. say like not milk is not milk that i was told about um <laughs> yeah. and then and then i was like what what is almond milk and they're like you know jake i'm gonna put this on jake this is not me jake said it's nut juice and and then we 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 laughed for i don't know if we'll cut this out but we couldn't have the i was like that's what it's called <laughs> But I think it's for you, for you, I mean, it's salmon cells. Um, I think it's going to be something really simple. Um, you know, you're probably going to take a word people already love and attach to it and do a lot of branding. I see one, I see one thing like the, the leader, whoever leads this uh, revolution inside of your current competitive, I don't know if it's competitive. You said there was like a couple other companies, but if anyone else is doing salmon, whoever the brand name is yeah. would take over. So when I go to the store, I, oh, I want, I want the wild type salmon. Right. Like, and then it would just become ubiquitous and people would understand that the, and it would be a brand thing. Like you don't say, I want a Tesla car. You say, I want a Tesla. Right. And, and, you know, we've seen that with other, you know, if you look at the beyond burger and impossible foods, like, you know, people don't ask for the beyond plant-based <laughs> patty, right. They, yeah. uh, it's just the beyond that's burger true. or yeah. the impossible burger. And, and that's kind of what it is. You're, you're right. And, you know, branding ultimately will be what it is, but from the standpoint of, of, you know, regulation, again, this is something that um, just becomes uh, a an issue of just consumer transparency, which which we you know, really believe strongly in, and um, I think is, is an important one. Um, but um, it's just one we haven't really achieved the consensus yet. Yeah, that's where the brand doesn't work when it, right. you have to have an industry term that everybody in the industry holds on to. Um, cause then it would become, no so you'd probably like pick something like curated salmon or you would, I would, what I would do, if, uh, there's like naming exercises and branding yeah, and marketing. Yeah. So like, what I would do is I'd like, look at your manufacturing process, like look at what you guys actually do, like see pictures of it, listen and understand and read about it. And then just kind of like start writing down words and figure out like, there will be something that'll come together through that process. And, uh, that's typically how I do like naming yeah, I, you know, that to some extent that you know those exercises have um, have been done, but I but I still feel like this is an elusive, <laughs> this is an elusive question uh, of of how to how to do it right. But um, are there other people doing salmon? Um, there are certainly um, uh, at least two or three other companies working on seafood. I don't know to what extent, you know, salmon um, is, you know, when we, when we began, uh, there were probably, there were probably four, maybe five other companies in the world working on this. And now the number is more than 50. Uh, and that's just in the last four years, which is, which is great. You know, so many people working on this, uh, this problem. And, um, and I, I don't see it as, as competition because none of us there, there's no product on the market except the chicken nugget that i was uh, describing um and so we're all kind of you know just just trying to make the best products uh, and work together at you know for the transparency of regulation um at this stage but uh it's been great to see this sort of really flourish into its its an, its own industry there are now companies that are starting um specifically to address some of the individual um, issues of um, of scaling for companies like ours to to support the industry um, like like ours, which is which is really heartening and and just I think a, a wonderful thing. What did what did the chicken nugget people do to get through regulatory? Like, how did they refer to their chicken nuggets? Yeah, I think um, I think it was cultivated meat is what, but I'm not I'm not sure. You might have to check, but I think that's what the um, the, the term that they used. When they were working with the um, with the government in Singapore, that doesn't sound bad. That's that's similar yeah. to cur curated salmon. It's just you know mm -hmm. the curated meat. Um, yeah, if you could make it shorter, I think curated be is better than. I mean, because you're curating, you're putting the things together. Yeah, I actually like versus that. Versus nature putting I like them curating. together. Yeah. I mean, it's what you're doing. You're curating these cells, like, and you're curating salmon. Yeah. It's not, it's not, de it's not, um, deceptive by any means. I mean, it's definition technically correct what you're doing. I really like that one. Yep. There you go. That's great. 
I'll send an invoice your way. No, <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> awesome. No, this is great. I've got one last question, and it should have been like the one of the first questions. Do you have like software developers or technology or computer systems? I, you mentioned like brewery type setup. Like, what yeah. sort of technology, even if it's like lab equipment, like what sort of geeky technology exists at your company? Oh, um, yeah. So a lot of it is around the, the, you know, the biological sciences. So it's things, it's ways to um, analyze a lot of the the data that comes um, from just studying our cells. So that can be everything from which nutrients are they using and systems that are used to, to, to measure that to um, when we look at very large data sets of um, of like basically sequencing the the genome of our cells to to make sure that there aren't any um, irregularities or any problems. Um, you know these are often very very large data sets that um, that we'll use a variety of different um, you know like software to 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 help us analyze. Um, I'd say those are the the main. Um, uh, I mean oh you know for for the. Um, the cultivators or the sort of fermenters that that we use there's there's always you know little sort of control towers that have their own um, often proprietary software um, to control everything from the the pH the temperature the you know rotational speed and and so forth um, so that's um, you know the, those are I think that that's a it's a pretty good sort of, you know, summary of, of the type of IT infrastructure that we need to, to do the, um, um, the, the the research that we do. Nice. You put a sign up. This is like curation center instead of lab. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, we, we, we don't call it the, the lab and, you know, it's like, yeah. Uh, um, I think for, for the same, but you know, a lot of foods actually start in a lab, like Doritos started in a lab, you know, and, um, and I wouldn't most... pair yourself up with Doritos. Right. Right. Those, well, those beer scientists. also, right. Exactly. <laughs> beer. Exactly. Okay. Beer works. Yeah. Beer yeah. works. Excellent point. <laughs>